Coming up on American Medicine Today, this year marks the 25th anniversary of the FDA approval for Viagra. Dr. Salvatore Giorgiani Jr. joins us to discuss how a quarter of a century has helped destigmatize a drug that improves quality of life. Then, John fell off the back of a truck, causing immediate pain and incapacitation. Luckily, he found the Bonatti Spine Institute and is happy to be back to work and enjoying his active lifestyle. Finally, we learn the true origins of spinal fusion surgeries. Dr. Artavan Astley sheds light on thousands of clinical articles that base claims off long-abandoned research. How could the FDA allow doctors to practice failed medicine? Find out coming up on American Medicine Today. Featuring cutting-edge science and medical innovation, touching personal stories of recovery from pain, along with political, social, and healthcare issues plaguing our nation. This is American Medicine Today, brought to you by the Bonatti Spine Institute and Alfred Bonatti, MD. Welcome to American Medicine Today. I'm Kimberly Brumel Bonatti alongside Ethan Euchre. So the condition of ED or erectile dysfunction is often something that people shy away from discussing publicly, but there are underlying causes that could lead to the condition that men actually need to know about. This year marks the 25th anniversary of the FDA approval for Viagra. And joining us to discuss is our dear friend, Dr. Salvatore Giorgiani Jr., Senior Science Advisor to the Men's Health Network. Thank you for joining us yet again, Dr. Sal. As always, my pleasure to be on with you. Let's start with the numbers. I mean, it's estimated that 30 million men here in the United States experience ED. What are some of those underlying factors that lead to the development of this condition? You know, it's, it's very interesting that a lot of the things that guys worry about but yes. don't really take the impetus to treat diabetes, hypertension, mm -hmm. uh, overweight, smoking, lack of exercise. These are things that we all know are important, but those are very often underlying conditions mm -hmm. that can predispose someone to erectile dysfunction. You see that it's very much based on cardiovascular competence mm -hmm. or the ability for blood vessels to do the work that they do. So anytime you have an underlying metabolic condition or physiologic condition, or even just lack of exercise that affects uh, blood vessel flow, it can have an impact. Now, there are cohorts of individuals who don't have any of these underlying metabolic conditions, but because of trauma, uh, they also have ED. Uh, and so there are lots of reasons for it, but the, the very good news is since 1997, when this medication and the other follow-on medications were approved, mm -hmm. there's actually a solution for that is going to help the majority of men and couples. So it's not just about the guys Correct. and fixing their plumbing. Right. It's about helping folks have good, healthy, intimate relationships, relationships which is so important to our, to our existence as, as human beings. It's <laughs> no secret that so many of us are overweight in this country. Diabetes is out of control. You know, uh, as you mentioned, heart disease or, you know, across the, the globe, uh, is there a lot of instance of erectile dysfunction? Yeah, that's, that's a very important question to answer. And it really follows what we sometimes call diseases of, of wealth. So if you look at countries where we have larger diets or richer diets, it is something that's found globally. Only about 20 to 25 percent tops, and I've actually seen numbers about 15 percent, of the individuals who uh, have to deal with ED, actually seek care. The fact that we're having this conversation today mm -hmm. wouldn't have been possible, I don't think, in 1995, mm. uh, where this was something that was couched in a plain brown wrapper. So now it's the kind of thing that people can talk about. It's been destigmatized to a great extent. And, you know, it, it's a very important thing for for couples to uh, to address when they need to. To me, it seems quite simple. The solution would be get in better shape, eat better, exercise. If people got in better shape, would they get that ability back? <laughs> well, not for all men. Uh, there, there is an age-associated loss of cardiovascular competence, no matter what you do. If you ate quick oatmeal six times a day and ran three miles, you still might at certain age have loss of cardiovascular competence. And there are other metabolic inherent physiologic conditions. So for a percentage of individuals, particularly those 
over 60, you could be in great shape and still have uh, ED or even partial ED. And certainly, of course, if you had trauma, uh, psychological or physical trauma, right. certain types, that, that also can cause it. So, yeah, it would, be, it would behoove us all to get in better shape everything from preventing infectious disease spread to managing high blood pressure to uh, preventing or mitigating ED. But, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that this medication does exist. Uh, and if guys and gals were compliant with, we wouldn't have so many of the diseases we have. But that's just not realistic, I'm afraid. Because it's the 25th anniversary, why don't we discuss how Viagra came to be? Didn't it really occur by accident? Uh, yes, like so many things in science, uh, there was the matter of serendipity. There was being developed by Pfizer as a medication to treat high blood pressure. It had a unique mechanism of action, which caused the blood vessels to dilate, open up uh, through a unique mechanism. And uh, the, the the fellow who I like to attribute as finding the Viagra effect, Ian Ostolo, was doing studies in healthy young men to look at how this medication would affect their blood pressure. And these required overnight stays. And the people who were doing the, the blood pressure measurements in these healthy young men were nice looking women nurses. And they happened to notice that they had mm -hmm. uh, a rise, uh, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, so that Ian's great uh, triumph was the fact that he observed this and he followed through on it. That's science, not following orthodoxy, but that's science following information. And that the product was developed from that. And I think the rest is very much history. Well, and it turned out to be obviously a very profitable mistake, if you will, because I believe Viagra became the first drug ever to surpass a billion dollars in sales. That's, that's pretty remarkable. Yeah. It is remarkable. It wasn't the first drug. I mean, some of the anti-acid agents that were, were amongst the first, but it certainly had a significant impact on revenue uh, out for Pfizer and Lilly and GSK. We're all in that game with ED medicines. And even today, you know, one of the things that's on the horizon is companies are looking to petition the FDA to get it to move from prescription drug status to over-the-counter status to try and get past that notion of stigma. Uh, and I think a lot of that is predicated on the fact that people need to understand this is, again, not just about fixing a guy's plumbing, but about people having healthy, intimate relationships throughout their life period. So, you know, it, it is a very interesting sort of saga. Show everyone that box. It's one of the original Viagra displays, I guess. This, this says a lot about the positioning of the medicine and what the company wanted to convey. Mm. This is a... Couples a dancing, pop up, you know, thing, and you can see the images are of couples dancing. It's about a serious, romantic relationship that's important to folks to remind them of the importance of this as something that is important for human uh, dignity. Doctor Sal, why don't you tell us about you know your latest venture with Healthy Men Inc. Yeah, Healthy Men Inc. is an organization that I and some of my colleagues founded to help make healthcare more guy friendly in an effort to get guys to want to go to treat those underlying conditions that we spoke about earlier. Because we don't want to, trust me. I know. And it's always the wives no. pushing the husbands. You're please, not. You're, you're my work wife and help. you push me to go, <laughs> you better get that checked out. We'll have you back on for a deep dive into that, Dr. Sal, because that, that Anytime sounds... I can be of help to you and your audience. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Dr. Sal. Take great care. Thanks, Doc. My pleasure. Bye-bye now. Make sure you stay tuned. Coming up after the break, a story of recovery. I went to Dr. Renati and he went ahead and looked at my pictures. He told me, you have pain here, you have pain here. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. I'd been to others, but he was a doctor that didn't want to fillet my back open like a fish and do like open spine surgery because everybody else wanted to do that and I was not having it. The anesthesiologist who was working with me, I was like having a conversation with this guy and then I was watching on the monitor as Dr. Benatti is fixing my back. I really felt like I was in good hands. Visit askbenatti.com. Welcome back to American Medicine Today. I'm Kimberly Benatti. I'd like to welcome to the show John Montgomery from Tennessee. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, John. Uh, Thank you for having me. Now, can you tell us how you came to be in pain and kind of describe what type of pain it was? Initially, I got 
was in the army. Been living with my entire life. Got me, but um, this recent incident, um, I fell off my truck at work, and yeah, basically it incapacitated me. Wow. And I do want to thank you for your military service. So you said you fell off a truck, and it really left you incapacitated. Where on your body were you actually feeling the pain? Most of it was my lower back, sciatic, um, running up and down my leg. Ugh. It was bad. And so what did you try to do to relieve that pain? I could do nothing. There was nothing I could do. Oh. I just dealt with it. So were you still able to do activities and just push through it? Well, I've pretty much done it my whole life. But wow. um, this time, it actually stopped me. I mean, I fell in February and then I was released to go back to work in April and I went back to work for five weeks and because I hadn't been doing what I'm used to doing it wasn't getting aggravated I just basically felt like it was the pain that I've been used to living with but as I got back to work it started getting worse and worse and worse and got to the point where I couldn't even lift my leg off of my fuel pedal to push my brake pedal it just oh got to the gosh, point where John. you know it never stopped me before but this time it did wow so that's really just the body kind of saying, John, it's time to take care of me. So at that point, what did you do? Did you try any conservative type treatments? Basically went to the doctor and he told me, he took MRIs and said, well, you might need back surgery. You might need hip surgery. We don't know. So he didn't know? He didn't know. He had no clue. Wow. Uh, they did the MRIs. He couldn't figure anything out. He referred me to... Uh, Vanderbilt University, and they pretty much said the same thing. I went for a second opinion where I had um, a myelogram done, which was extremely painful. And that doctor turned around and said the same thing. I can't find any problem. So all of these doctors can see that you can barely function, and they're all telling you, gee, uh, we don't know why. We don't see anything. And by all intents and purposes, you should be fine. Correct. So where do you turn at that point? At that point, I had no idea where to turn. I mean, I was told from the disability company to sign up for Social Security Disability. And it was like, I can't live like this. And I just, I didn't know where to turn. I was at the end of my ropes because they basically said, we can't help you. I'm sorry to hear that. So tell me, you live in Tennessee. How was it that you made the trip all the way down to Hudson, Florida, about 40 minutes north of Tampa? My father-in-law saw your advertisement, I guess. Consistently reflect 98.75% patient satisfaction. 75,000 procedures have been... It's like, what do I got to lose? So I called and they said, do you have images? I had an MRI and a myelogram. It's like, send them over. I think that was a Friday... I sent him over, and then the following Tuesday, Dr. Bonatti himself called me and started talking. I tried to tell him what was going on, and he told me, shut up. It's like, excuse me. <laughs> it's like, don't tell me what's wrong with you. I will tell you what's wrong with you. And he went through a list, and he hit the nail on the head on every single thing that was going on with my body. And then he turned around and said, I can help you. So tell us about your evaluation day. I mean, after suffering for so long and all these doctors kind of telling you, that there was nothing wrong. What was it like to actually hear the doctor tell you that you could be helped? I mean, I'd, I've been waiting to hear that my whole life. But at this point in time, I was re regretting going to sleep because I was going to sleep. I was in pain. I was waking up. I was in pain. I, I needed to do something. And the whole entire time, four months to be exact, I was waiting for the other doctors to fix me. Wow. And then they turned around, we can't fix you. Right. And when Dr. Bernardi said, I can fix you, it was like, okay, when can we do this? It's like, when do you want to do it? It's like, next week? Come on down. So tell us about your evaluation day. I mean, after suffering for so long and other doctors telling you really that nothing was wrong, what was it actually like to hear someone knew and actually understood your pain? I was excited. I was looking forward to it. And I wasn't looking forward to surgery, but I was also <laughs> looking not being in pain anymore. You have your Bonatti spine procedures finished now. What was it like in the recovery room when you're actually taking your first steps post-surgery? I was sore, but it was from the incision. But uh, uh, the, the first surgery pretty much took away the pain I had in my leg from the sciatica. All right. It was pretty much all gone. 
Your actual steps post-op, though, what was that like to walk and not have that excruciating pain that brought you into the Bonatti Spine Institute? It was it was awesome. Yeah, well, I mean, I did post op uh, on t- or on Wednesday, and they said walk, and I walked. We walked out. We walked on the beach, me and my wife, and mm-hmm. and I did a couple thousand steps, and I felt good. I, I I felt fantastic. Now I hear you got back to an active lifestyle pretty quickly after returning to Tennessee. Can you tell us about that? Well. The day we got back, which was the day before Thanksgiving, I actually went hunting. Hunting. <laughs> and, and, and prior to that, I'd tried going out and I took a little walk. And uh-huh. when I got, I was in so much pain. I was down for like two days. I was hurting so bad. Aww. And three days after my surgery, I went hunting and took the same walk. And I was great. Well, that's the miraculous nature of the Bonatti Spine Procedures. Thank you, John, for sharing your story of recovery with us. You're welcome. Thanks, Take John. great and- care. Now, if you want to find out if you're a candidate for the exclusive Bonatti Spine Procedures, visit askbonatti.com. And if you would like to see more stories just like John's, you can search the Bonatti Spine Institute on YouTube. I think everybody was shocked, like, really, you had surgery today? I had a drain tube. I was at my desk doing payroll for 200 employees, worked till night, got up, went to bed. Actually, the recovery was great. I mean, I really immediately felt the difference. I was able to go back to work within a couple of days. The progress after each procedure was amazingly good. The recovery, all told, has been phenomenal. The recovery was pretty easy. I was able to walk around after surgery with no problem. It was like, you know, like a reborn again when I was able to walk off that table and walk out and go for lunch. I went in there at 10 o'clock, got operated on. At 12 o'clock, I was walking out on my own. We went to the Bonatti Institute and that was the day, the turning point in my life. This type of surgery is so much more advanced and the recovery time is so much less that it's just a no-brainer. If you've got pain, go to Bonatti. This is the honest to God truth. And was recovering, I didn't feel anything. The pain that I was suffering is gone. I can go back to work in like three days. The surgeries that I had, actually, I recovered very easily from, I would say. Um, I actually went to work the following afternoon. That afternoon, when it was done, I actually felt so much better already. Six days after surgery, I was back in the gym, slowly but surely working my way back to back to fighting, back, back to basically 100% of fighting, you know? So six days, and everybody was in awe, like, didn't you just get out of surgery? I'm like, yeah, I feel great. And like, okay, let's see how you do. And I was rolling with everybody, and I'm in the advanced class, so. That sounds a lot right there. First time I came in here was Monday, and today is Thursday. I've had two surgeries and am doing fantastic. I'm still in shock that I can walk. That's all within four days. Bonatti succeeds where others fail. Welcome back to American Medicine Today. I'm Kimberly Bonatti alongside Ethan Euchre. Now, as we've often discussed on this program, medical device companies are making billions from promoting its use of installing screws in spine surgery that not only don't work, but end up causing unnecessary pain and suffering. Joining us to discuss is Dr. Artivan Asley, board-certified spine surgeon and author of Corporate Spine, How Spinal Surgery Went Off Track and How We Put It Right. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Asley. Thank you very much for hosting me. I really appreciate your help. Why don't you start off by telling us how these medical device companies are actually able to make billions off spine surgery with little proven effectiveness? Well, um, it, it's a very big question, and it took me three to four years to actually figure this out. One of the things that we do in the world of spine surgery is fusion. To increase the rate of fusion, we put screws and rods to immobilize it. Why? Because we learned from orthopedic surgery that the key for bone healing is immobilization. So right around 1990s, we started putting these screws and rods. Initial reports were very bad. There were about 7,000 lawsuits against the manufacturer. Then in 1993, a paper was published by a doctor named Dr. Zedeblik. He's a chair of uh, spine surgery in the University of Wisconsin. In his paper, he said that it 
basically everything screws work beautifully. I mean, his results were just wonderful. The problem is that after that, six other papers came out, multinational, multi-center, saying that these screws don't work. And then when I found this out, because I was uh, developing the device myself, I said, what's going on here? Let me figure out what's going on. Let me dig into this paper at 1993 a little bit deeper. First thing that I found out was that that paper in 1993 was not finished. Hmm. It's published as a preliminary report in 1993. I spent about two years to look for the final report, and I couldn't find it. Eventually, I talked to a professor, and he said, oh, yeah. That study was not finished. It was abandoned in the middle. I was like, wait a minute. Abandoned? Uh, <laughs> abandoned in the middle. There is no final report. It, if you Google that study right now, Google Zedeplik Spine Fusion article, you will see that this paper has been referenced in 1,125 articles. This is one of the most referenced papers in the entire world of spine surgery. Everything that we do in the world of spine surgery today, tracks back to this one paper written by one man that it didn't finish. Okay. Then, in starting in 1993, Dr. Zedevlis starts getting paid from the manufacturer of these screws as the, the lawsuits against the manufacturer was dropping out because of his paper. So by 19, 2003, he had gotten paid $34 million dollars. Then in 2004, 2005, the same company put him in charge of another very important study, a study about a bone graft substitute. When we do our fusions, we have to put bone graft between the two bones so they can solidify. Well, getting that bone is very difficult because we have to harvest it from somewhere, which becomes right. a secondary problem. So uh, there's a hormone that we all excrete when you break your bones. It's called bone morphogenic protein. So they uh, produced this and comes as a sponge. So they gave this study to Dr. Zedeblik to publish the paper. Well, guess what? He publishes this paper in 2004. This time he gets caught falsifying his results. And then it was an investigation by who? By United States Senate. Hmm. It was the United States Senate conclusion that the paper that he published in 2004 was not written by him was written by the company oh. that sell that makes and sells the screws. Correct. That he paid them multi billions of dollars <laughs> to do. Wow. So they use Is him. It, He's the patsy. This doctor was the chair, was the head editor of a spinal disorders journal, one of the most important journals from 2002 all the way to like 2018. No time in the history of medicine a company has had such a direct access to literature of a certain specialty. This is just beyond belief. This is just crazy wrong. And so what happens? Know? Do they hold him accountable or does he continue to perpetuate this lie injuring millions of people? Mm. No, he's a, he's a chairman of uh, spine surgery in the University of Wisconsin. He just stepped down. He just, just got retired just recently. It is absolutely out of this world. As a matter of fact, I'm not just saying this. There was, if you go to YouTube and say, um, Karagi spine fusion, mm -hmm. you will see a segment that actually in 2011, because of that investigation in 2004, CNN was looking for Dr. Zedeplik. That's just the tip of the iceberg. The paper that he published in 1993 has far worse consequences that nobody even pays attention to it. He is the vessel, but the problem is much, much deeper. It's just not acceptable. What is going on? As orthopedic surgeons, we learned in bone fracture fixation that the key is rigid fixation. Uh, there's, a, there's a technique that we call AO technique. It came from uh, Switzerland. You put the bones together, you put screws in place to hold them together so the bone can heal. Well, we knew that that worked, so we applied that same knowledge to spinal fusions. And that's what we've continued with it. So it's not just the papers that said this. In orthopedic surgery, it gets hammered into our head that the rigid fixation is the key. Well, this is the problem. Rigid fixation works in extremity 
Because one key important factor, because we can eliminate gravity hmm. in a leg, we can put on crutches, non-weight bear in the arm, of course, you have the sling. In spine, we cannot eliminate gravity. That means that the second that patient gets up, that construct, that screws and rods are under tremendous amount of stress. Mm -hmm. So the way I explain it is that we've been able to achieve these high rises in earthquake zones. We have like Burj Khalifa. We have these all tall buildings for one specific reason, because we realize that we do not make these buildings stiff. We actually make it reactive so they can mm -hmm. flex, so, so they, they can, can dissipate the energy. Right. If the wind comes through, they can swing. If the earthquake comes through, they can swing. That's the key. And that's what I try to bring across these orthopedic spine surgeons. Mm -hmm. Somehow I can't get through their head. They are stuck in the fact that rigid fixation is the answer. And then, and that's what the direction they're going for. I mean, they're going they're stuck in that in direction. The past. They're, they're completely it's, stuck in the past. My husband paved the path. He's the reason that minimally invasive spine surgery is even in the marketplace. But he has targeted precision procedures, and he has spoken out for decades, decades, back in the 80s, saying he will no longer do hardware fusion surgeries because it was of no benefit to the patient. One level fusion fails 65% of the time. Two to three level fusions fail 85% of the time and cause a chain reaction. And the ones that seem the small percentage of successful fusions, they fail within two years. So he releases the pain. He doesn't use any rods, screws, plates, anything like that. And he says, you need to be mobile. There is no such thing as like this invisible instability. So he agrees with you on that. And these screws and plates are injuring people left and right. They're getting loose in bones and they're mangling and tangling in nerves. That's the problem. Uh, because initially in, in beginning of my practice, I was like that because I was trained to do these big surgeries. Mm -hmm. In 20 years in practice, I've realized that what these surgeries do to patients. Right. So I have... I've pulled back quite a bit. And so you're absolutely right. Your husband is absolutely right. We appreciate you being on the program, Dr. Artivan Asli. Thank you for having me. That wraps up this episode. Make sure you check out Rumble and search American Medicine Today for previous episodes. We'll see you back here next week on Newsmax. If you have any comments or questions, contact us at the number below. Tweet at Dr. Benati. For a previous episode, head over to Rumble and search American Medicine Today.